Halicrafters Sky Buddy S19, first run, 1938. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project, available in video and in written form, made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is welcome and appreciated. The Sky Buddy was the name used by Halicrafters for a series of junior receivers starting from 1937. Right after the first of these models, in 1938 appeared the receiver S19 visible in this advert, published in QST magazine, May 1938. In 1939, Halicrafters was already promoting the third model of this series, the S19R, visible in an advert published in the magazine QST February 1939. Nevertheless, the Model S19 was produced in two different runs, having the same external aesthetics, but a different tube complement. The first run contained the tube type 6P7 with the function of IF amplifier and beat frequency oscillator, while the second run used the tube 6L7 for the same functions, but with a different electrical arrangement. Unfortunately, the only original schematic diagram that seems to be available is the one for the second run. This restoration project is about the Model S19 first run using the tube type 6P7, and this is the condition in which this set arrived. In particular, the tuning knob is not original. The second IF transformer was replaced with a newer type installed upside down, and the detector tube has a goat shield, which was not intended to be part of the radio set. The first thing to do is usually to remove the chassis from the cabinet starting from the knobs, like what was done with this set. The set screws of the knobs are rusted, therefore some oil is applied first. Also, the dial scale is installed like a very large knob. After a little while, the set screws are released and, starting with the rotating dial scale, the knobs are removed. The tuning knob, which in this radio is not the original one, has only one set screw, but it requires a special screwdriver insert bit. It is possible to completely extract the set screw, but it seems that the knob does not want to move anyway. At this point, all the other knobs have been removed. Only the tuning knob is still stuck on its shaft. Unfortunately, even this method does not work and a different plan is needed. This radio model has a cabinet that is installed around the chassis and the upper part of the chassis could become accessible just by removing the upper lid. However, I realized that only later. After having removed all the tubes, considering that the second IEF transformer is hanging from its wires and therefore it can be pushed aside, it is possible to reach the tuning shaft from behind, loosening the nuts that press on the friction.
The new plan about the tuning knob is to extract it together with the shaft, but there is another obstacle before that goal, a C-clip. Without the proper tools, removing the C-clip became a battle in which the old clip had to be destroyed. But the shaft still doesn't want to get out. Waiting for better inspiration, there are still other components waiting to be loosened from the cabinet, and then, finally, also the upper lid is removed. With a better view of the area, it is now possible to use the right amount of force to extract the shaft, verifying that nothing gets broken in the process. There are still two long screws that hold the chassis on the bottom of the cabinet. Removing them, the chassis is finally free. Only for reference, this is the initial electrical condition above and under the chassis. Removing the variable capacitor gears is fairly easy. When the gears were removed, it was possible to start cleaning the chassis. That was done in different stages on different days. Initially a soupy oven cleaner was used to remove the most superficial gunk. Later a product containing phosphoric acid was used to continue cleaning and removing some rust. Finally, a gel rust remover was applied. In the process, alcohol was used to wash from the residues of the other products to avoid inducing corrosion some time later. Unfortunately, the products used against rust are also very aggressive. When the phosphoric acid was used, a drop must have touched the license plate on the back of the chassis, erasing some of the writing. The variable capacitor has lost its grommets. Only some invisible residues remain. Unfortunately, the band switch selector together with the coils and trimmer capacitors is installed right underneath, and it is not advisable to remove the variable capacitor just for installing new grommets. Therefore, something else is experimented ending up in installing nylon insulators and small pieces of heat shrink pipe.
This socket and plug on the side of the chassis is not part of the original set, and it was installed probably to get outside the filament voltage and some B-plus for an external device. Before going any further, the AC voltages are tested without the tubes on the chassis. The result is promising showing a working power transformer. The electrolytic capacitor can found on the chassis is not original because it contains three capacitors of much higher capacity than originally used and because one of them is connected as a cathode bypass for the detector and preamplifier tube, which would be very unusual. A plan is made for putting a refitted capacitor can, but with four electrolytic capacitors inside, to serve also the final amplifier tube as cathode bypass. For the purpose a different and larger capacitor can is opened, cleaned from its guts, and then installed. For cleaning the can inside, first some alcohol is used, then acetone helps in removing the residues of tar. When everything is clean, 422 microfarads capacitors are connected together joining the same negative terminal. To protect from major damages in case of shorts on the B-plus line, I prefer to put a 230 volts halogen light bulb in series right after the rectifier tube. If possible, that would be 20 watts only. Here the chassis is scratched to prepare for soldering some copper used to support the light bulb socket. Some Vaseline oil is put on top of the scratched area. What follows should be self-explanatory.
In order to work on the chassis and test the progress, it is important to be able to connect and disconnect the loudspeaker, especially when there is a field coil and when the audio transformer is fixed on the loudspeaker structure. If the radio does not provide a different method, I prefer to use automotive spade connectors for this purpose. Here the original cloth insulated wires are used, but later due to bad shorts with sparks happening on the B plus line, they have been replaced with new silicon insulated wires. For reference, it is always a good idea to measure the impedance of the output transformer with its loudspeaker. What is needed is a signal generator, a resistor with a value in the same magnitude of the expected impedance that the output transformer might have, and a multimeter capable of measuring low AC voltages. In this particular radio, the output transformer might have to operate with the secondary winding disconnected because a headset is inserted in the output jack. So it would be interesting to know what happens to the impedance also in this case. This clip shows the process starting with the loudspeaker connected as it should with the help of a jumper wire. Initially the multimeter is used to measure the value of the chosen resistor. It is about 9.86 kilo ohms. Then the multimeter is set for measuring AC voltages and the signal generator is connected and activated. The voltage across the resistor is about 3.59 volts. The voltage across the primary winding of the output transformer is about 3.72 volts. The calculated impedance is about 10 kilo ohms. The same process is repeated after disconnecting the loudspeaker, and the result in this case is an impedance of about 30 kilo ohms. This radio set arrived with an extra shield for the detector and preamplifier tube that was not originally planned, an electrolytic cathode bypass capacitor for the same tube, in parallel with what was the original cathode bypass capacitor, and an additional capacitor which very likely was also not in the original design. All this might suggest that the radio suffered from internal oscillations in the audio preamplifier section. And in fact, an early test done when only the audio section was restored without using the extra shield for the tube type 6Q7 showed the possibility to start oscillations. This issue will be solved keeping the old modifications and changing the value of one capacitor, but the details will be shown later in the section about the schematics. After having replaced all the components that needed to be changed under the chassis, it is possible to test the radio even though the electrical restoration is not finished and the alignment has not been done yet that would allow later to make comparisons verifying the improvements if there will be any. Therefore this early test is kept for reference knowing that it was recorded at night between 9 and 10 p.m. This is band 1 medium wave.
This is band 2, short wave tropical. There is usually hardly something to hear in this band, except from noise generated by appliances. This is band 3, short wave, up to 18 megahertz. The beat frequency oscillator is working. The knobs should be removable. Therefore, everything was tried to separate the main tuning knob from its shaft. Drilling a hole on top of the knob to push down the shaft from there is the only option that worked. By the way, this particular knob might have come from a BC348 receiver, which is said. The second IEF transformer of this set was replaced with a much more modern component with two cores on top of each other requiring a special tool for the alignment. Typically the GC8282 or the RS543-147. From a random collection of old IEF transformers bought online, a more suitable model was chosen. It happens to be the Jelloso 685 mentioned in the Jelloso Technical Bulletin number 23, Spring 1937. Even if it was meant to operate as a first IEF transformer, it is adapted here to operate with the detector tube instead. Unfortunately, the original IF can used for this radio model has a different shape and it is also taller. Therefore, some thin iron sheet is used to cut a new can for the Geloso replacement. The following accelerated clips show the process. Two screws without head must be soldered at the bottom of the can.
One brass washer is soldered on top of the can for connecting and holding the body of the IF transformer inside the can. The chassis of this radio was not designed thinking of possible maintenance for the IF transformers and installing the new can requires some ingenuity. Some wax from a tea light is put on the coils for protecting them against corrosion. It should have been done before mounting the IF transformer body, but better late than never. It is now time to put the shield on with the due care for internal insulation, considering that one of the transformer's coils is connected to B+. On a homemade IF can, the insulation of the trimmer capacitors on top might be a serious issue. Therefore, the washers are replaced with nylon equivalents. But, because in this case the thread of the screws is metric, also nylon screws are used that would make the alignment procedure much safer. Later, a thought was given to the two mica capacitors contained inside the Jelloso IF transformer. In fact, measuring them, one was off tolerance, while Jelloso was known for making very precise capacitors. Therefore, they have been later replaced with NP0 equivalents. According to the alignment procedure available on BAMA, quote, anchor manual archive, the intermediate frequency used for this receiver is 455 kilohertz. However, the first IEF transformer has both trimmers set for maximum capacity, but the actual alignment is higher than 455 kilohertz anyway. Therefore, this transformer needs to be inspected. Extracting the shield without detaching the wires under the chassis is a job in itself. This clip is kept to document the struggle, considering that there are also other radio models using the same type of IF can. However, trying later to put the shield back with wires as short as in this case turns out to be just impossible. Therefore, later the wires have been replaced and kept about one inch longer than strictly needed, hiding the excesses inside the shield. In the meantime, two NP0 capacitors have been added in parallel to the trimmer capacitors, with the hope to allow later a correct alignment to 455 kilohertz. Unfortunately, this was not the case and various attempts have been needed later.
However, at this point, the same concern about the insulation of the trimmer capacitors is experienced due to the fact that the original insulation made of a very thin piece of paper is definitely insufficient. Moreover, in this case, the trimmer screws have a fine UNF thread incompatible with the available nylon screws. Therefore, the original metal screws must be kept. But the holes on the IEF shield have been enlarged to avoid the risk of shorting the screws to ground. The following accelerated clips show the full process of extraction, adaptation and reinstallation of one of the various attempts for finding the correct value for the capacitors in parallel with the trimmers. Also wax was added because some heat shrink pipe was used and every time the original wax drift away. Just for the record, in the end a value of 47 pico farads had to be added in parallel with each trimmer capacitor. The alignment procedure for SkyBuddy Models 19 underlines the fact that the frequency of 455 kHz was adopted by the Radio Manufacturers Association, probably because the previous SkyBuddy Model 5T was using 465 kHz instead. 
the alignment procedure recommends to remove the grid cap of the mixer converter tube, injecting the signal directly to the grid using just a decoupling capacitor. In this restoration, because after a while the tube started behaving in a strange way, it was preferred to let the grid connect it in circuit. Unlike other radios, if the first band is selected, the variable capacitor should not be let fully mashed because in this case the IF chain would resonate in two different places creating confusion during the alignment. For this restoration the third band was chosen and because of the attenuation caused by the antenna coils the injected signal had to be relatively stronger than usual. Here the alignment is verified starting from a non-modulated signal connecting a multimeter at the beginning of the AVC line where the impedance is lower, seeking for the lowest possible voltage. Here is the final upside down bell curve, read at the beginning of the AVC line, scanning from 450 to 460 kilohertz. The specialty of this receiver is the complex system of gears for the tuning dial. They deserve special cleaning care and it is about time of doing it because this mechanical system is needed for the RF alignment. These clips show the cleaning process using acetone, alcohol and a gel rust removal product. The rust removal product is always washed with alcohol, but later off camera all the gears have been washed with water and dish soap, then rinsed and washed again with alcohol. In the end, a lot of Vaseline grease was used to add extra protection to all the gears. It is now time to clean and install the main tuning shaft with its friction. The main tuning shaft was kept in place by a C-clip that was destroyed. Not having a proper replacement, a nylon washer was used instead.
plate with all the gears is installed back on the chassis, properly aligned with the variable capacitor. Finally, the variable capacitor is connected to its gear, paying attention to the correct orientation for the stop lugs. The dial of this receiver is very important and cleaning should be done with great care for preserving the writings. Initially the attention is given to the central part, which is less delicate. A small piece of fine steel wool is used to polish the knob in the middle. Then, a soupy oven degreaser is tried in the central part of the dial, where the most important dirt accumulated with the years. Once verified that it does not dissolve the ink, the same detergent is used more extensively, but always with delicacy. Once cleaned, the dial is installed temporarily on the chassis for allowing a preliminary RF alignment. The alignment procedure for Sky Buddy Model S19 describes a simplified method involving only the oscillator section and ignoring the trimmers in the antenna section. It is probably advisable to also align the antenna trimmers for the upper part of the respective bands. The trimmers are identified by numbers and letters depending on their functions according to this map. The A2 antenna input should be shorted to ground. The signal for the alignment should be provided at the A1 antenna input with an impedance compensator, dummy antenna, or just a 400 ohms resistor in series. Then these are all the adjustments that should be done. In these clips, only a preliminary alignment is prepared and it should be repeated when the chassis is in its metal cabinet. Band 1. Medium Wave
band two. Band 3. Short wave. The internal oscillator stops working at about 14 MHz, therefore, the tremors CC and CD are set in correspondence of 12 MHz. After a preliminary RAF alignment, like in this case, unless otherwise specified in the original documentation, it is advisable to verify that the oscillator is working correctly above the tuned frequency. In other words, the tuned frequency plus the IEF frequency. For this purpose, a coil with a few turns was connected to an antenna preamplifier, and its output was read by a small frequency counter. One should consider that if the input signal is too strong, the output would contain harmonics and the frequency counter would report a value that is much higher than it should be. In other words, the lower but stable frequency readable is usually the correct one. On band 1, the tuned frequency of about 600 kHz was verified. On band 2, the tuned frequency of about 1.9 MHz was verified. On band 3, the tuned frequency of about 6.3 MHz was verified. In a similar way, it is possible to use this pre-amplified probe with an oscilloscope that is not sufficiently sensitive otherwise. For example, it is possible to verify at what point the oscillator stops working in this particular set.
This test was done after the preliminary RF alignment in the early evening. As usual, it starts from band 1, and at the lowest receivable frequency, there is already a strong station to hear. It is precisely at 549 kHz. On band 2, except for noise, there is nothing to hear as expected. On band 3, on the upper side, there are some stations. Okay, 
also a number station could be heard, but the BFO was not correctly aligned yet. In this receiver, the BFO oscillator is obtained with a tried section contained in the tube type 6P7. The BFO circuit seems to be isolated from the rest of the radio, but in practice it communicates with the pentode section of the same tube through small internal capacitances. The beat frequency is controlled by a variable inductor, which has a threaded shaft on top of which there is a slot for a screwdriver. This threaded shaft could travel through multiple turns, and the purpose of the alignment is to limit this movement to less than a full turn, but around the IF frequency. Therefore, around the threaded shaft there is a pipe, the position of which can be adjusted, limiting then the rotation of the internal shaft. Here is how the alignment proceeds. A 455 kHz signal is injected as it was already done for the IF alignment. The BFO is activated and the screw holding the external pipe to the threaded shaft is released. The threaded shaft is adjusted to reach zero beat frequency. The external screw is tightened again at the middle rotation position. The schematics available in the original documentation of this receiver consider only the second run with the tube 6L7. The differences with the first run are significant because the tubes 6L7 and 6P7 are quite different. For convenience, here is a rewritten version of the original schematic diagram. The schematic diagram for the first run has been reverse engineered from the radio under restoration, but there remains a little bit of uncertainty due to the presence of newer components of different value than expected. Anyhow, this is what seemed reasonably the original schematic diagram for the first run. During previous servicing, some components had been changed with different values or just added. However, returning to the reverse engineered schematics that represent the original configuration, there are a few details to observe. The capacitor C19 that is reported in the second run was not there in the unit under restoration, but even in the first SkyBuddy 5T, there was a capacitor with the same function, although connected differently. The AVC smoothing capacitor that here has been labeled C30 is connected in an odd way between the AVC line and the cathode of the 6P7. The capacitor found in the chassis was original and connected with the external foil towards the AVC line, but it doesn't seem right even though it must have been installed like this by the factory. Finally, the most important mistake made by the factory, the resistor R2 appears in the model 5T and in the second run of the S19 connected to the cathode of the converter mixer tube and not to ground. 
moving the resistor or two to the correct position, to the cathode of the converter mixer tube, the oscillator finally works up to the end of band 3, although the oscillation is very weak there. Here is the demonstration using the probe already seen in a previous section. Therefore, the correct schematic diagram of the first run of the model S19 should have been this one. If all the S19 first runs had been built with these issues, they must have been real troublemakers, and that might explain why no original schematics were issued, and why these units are so rare nowadays. During this restoration more changes have been made, to avoid internal oscillation, without having to shield the detector and preamplifier tube. Moreover, in the final arrangement, some halogen light bulbs have been added for controlling possible excessive current draws and are for dropping some voltage from the mains. In fact, the radio will be used with 50 Hz AC, and the power transformer would not be able to stand the full input voltage of 120 volts. The receiver was used and some signs of human dirt around the tuning and volume control knobs are clearly visible. The cabinet needs cleaning at the very least, but there are also some signs of superficial rust that should be taken care of. At the moment an oven degreaser is used gently to see if maybe the original writings can be saved. But there is still the fine tuning indicator frame, as well as the fixed tuning indicator residues to remove. Four feet on the bottom panel can also be removed. A more intense cleaning is attempted with the same oven degreaser tested before, but this time the writing seemed to suffer from it. It is then the turn of a product containing phosphoric acid for cleaning from the superficial rust. Where there is a little bit of corrosion, some fine sandpaper helps in removing the harder rust residues. On the front panel a lot of care is used to avoid touching the writings. Then, it is the turn of some acetone to smooth in the old black paint and to allow removing little splashes of wall paint together with old glue. Obviously, as previously done, the surface of the writings on the front panel is carefully avoided. Finally, but off camera, the top and bottom panels are spray painted with an opaque black color while the front and lateral panel is spray painted with an opaque but clear lacquer. It is about time to put the radio back together starting from the fine tuning indicator frame. However, the original clear plastic is deformed at the point that 
When the receiver was used, it brushed on the fine-tuning dial, leaving visible signs of it. Therefore, some thin clear plastic is recovered from a small vegetable basket, reproducing the original plastic, which, however, is installed between the frame and the cabinet to avoid touching the rotating dial. It seems then appropriate to prepare the bottom panel, which should get attached to the chassis. Therefore, the bottom feet are put back in place. There are two special screws that were made for holding the chassis to the bottom panel. The chassis does not take the whole surface of the bottom panel, and it is aligned on a side. Before mounting the front and lateral panel to the chassis, it is better to install the loudspeaker to it first. Here the speaker grill was already cleaned carefully and some thin black cloth is used behind the grill for extra protection of the loudspeaker. The cloth is sewed around the grill. The best way to make holes on the fabric is to use a soldering iron. The fine tuning dial must be installed on its shaft before putting the front panel in front of it. It is important to align it so that it starts from zero and ends at zero. When the panel is put in front of the chassis, the nuts of the headphone jack and of the two potentiometers are put on, but for now they are only finger tightened. 76-32U and C hexagonal slotted head screws are used to connect the front and lateral panel to the bottom panel. Please notice that they don't have the washer-like base. Nowadays these screws are very difficult to find. 
and in fact the receiver arrived with one screw missing and another one non-original instead of replacing all the screws with new style ones which would have altered significantly the aesthetics of this receiver the missing screws were recovered from the leftovers of a previous restoration by the way to reduce the friction on the surface of the panel while putting these screws some small and not noticeable stainless steel washers have been added only when the bottom screws are in place it is possible to tighten the nuts of the potentiometers and phone jack the send or receive switch requires some effort for putting it back on the front panel At this point, it is a good idea to put the tubes back on the chassis. The external disc dial is installed from outside the chassis. The tuning indicator was rebuilt using a piece of acrylic glass and now is installed on top of the disc dial. The IF alignment is repeated with a satisfactory result reading the negative voltage of the ABC AGC line on the oscilloscope which on purpose was made available above the chassis the RF alignment is also repeated and it is mandatory to use an insulated screwdriver to avoid shorts when dealing with the trimmer capacitors accessible from the holes under the bottom panel But then it becomes apparent that the tuning scale cannot be accurate because the disk dial does not follow precisely the movement of the variable capacitor. In these clips the signal injected has a stable frequency, but for small variations the disk dial would not move or depending on the previous rotation direction the received signal would appear in two different positions. Maybe this is another reason why this receiver model was immediately replaced by a revised design without this complex system of gears. The top panel should be put in place with care considering that it is meant to be mounted when the tubes are already on the chassis. The seven screws are inserted and later tightened. However, one hole where the original screw was missing appears to have lost the thread.
to solve the issue a nut must be used from inside the cabinet. Luckily, in that area, there is enough space to do it. The original knobs are mounted on their shafts. The tuning knob, which already was not original, is replaced with something else because the usage of the one that came with the radio bent the delicate shaft. Therefore, at least for now, the new knob installed is a plastic one painted black to match with the look of the receiver. At this point, everything seems to be working well, including the phone output which is tested in this clip with a high impedance headset. Also the regular reception using the loudspeaker seems to be okay. until some important and mysterious hum appears, even with the volume control at zero. After some unsuccessful investigation, the loudspeaker is removed from the panel again. Removing the loudspeaker when the front panel is still connected to the chassis is not ideal and, unfortunately, with a wrong maneuver the cone was perforated. However, it is also true that the cone paper was already very dry and brittle and it should have received attention before this accident. Some glue that would remain elastic also when it is cured is used to attach the patch made of thin tea bag paper and to paint the surface of the whole cone. Later, when it is possible to test the loudspeaker again, the source of the hum is found in the vibrations produced by the field coil. By the way, in this case, using insulating gloves is mandatory, considering that the visible exposed contacts are connected to the B+. With the radio turned off, it is possible to see that the field coil is loose, unfortunately by design. Some hot glue was used to make sure that the field coil could not move. Hot glue was chosen because, if necessary, it would be easily removed by melting it again using a hot air gun. Hopefully, the loudspeaker is mounted for the last time in this restoration. At this point, the restoration could have been finished because the hum troubles were solved and the radio was capable of working fairly well. However, the unreliability of the external dial scale movement and its difficult readability were frustrating. It seemed appropriate to add an RF buffer for allowing an external frequency counter to read the internal oscillator frequency. Initially, the design from Mr. Carlson was used. See this video for more detailed information about it. This is an RF adapter with a high impedance input 
and a low impedance output for feeding an external frequency counter. Later, a slightly different but personal design was used based on the FETJ310 and two NPN transistors 2 and 3904. For the rectification of the filament power supply, a common diode 1 and 4007 was used, and a resettable fuse was added. Model T F25090. The drawing shows also the implementation on a small prototype board looking at the component side. The signal was collected from the oscillator plate, pin 6 of the tube type 6K8. A suitable space was found close to the oscillator and mixer 2. Two standoffs were soldered on the chassis and the board was installed there. For connecting the external frequency counter without drilling the chassis, something to be soldered on the chassis was fabricated for holding a BNC connector. Before that, the option of using a connector SO239 introduced in the 1930s and thus period appropriate for the item under restoration was also considered. However, that type of connector would have been more difficult to use, obliging to perform harder operation on the chassis with the chances of hurting the tubes or the operator. Therefore, it was judged safer to install the more modern BNC connector. At this point, a frequency counter prototype was made using an old cardboard box, putting inside a cheap frequency counter with programmable IF value and an antenna preamplifier. When that was operational, it was immediately possible to revise the RF dial alignment in a much more comfortable and effective way. The usual picking with the signal generator was necessary only for adjusting the antenna trimmer capacitors. When the restoration seemed to be finished, while turning on the unit after some days of inactivity, there was the noise of another loud spark. Without waiting to listen to more of those loud warnings, the radio returned on the workbench, and the chassis was extracted again. This slideshow summarizes the right steps for getting the chassis out of the cabinet. Unlike my previous restorations, for this radio I thought it was nice to keep at least some of the original cloth insulated wires. Under the circumstances, that was a mistake, and all the B-plus connections had to be rewired. Because at this point, with almost all the capacitors and resistors already replaced, replacing also the filament wires would have been too complicated, a fuse was added before the filament supply. Placing the fuse holder on the same box that was used for the input power fuses. The wires for the second IEF transformer were replaced. With the occasion, the resistor R3 was replaced with a slightly lower value with the hope to improve the oscillation above 14 MHz. And in fact, there was some minimal improvement, but not substantial. This is the final schematic diagram with the updated voltage readings. Here is the collection of replaced or removed parts. A final view under and above the chassis. This junior ham receiver does not have an antenna preamplifier stage that could filter the tuned signal sufficiently for avoiding the reception of image frequencies. Therefore, a strong station can appear on the dial where it is supposed to be, according to the transmission frequency, but also twice the IEF frequency below.
Unfortunately, the internal oscillator still struggles with frequencies above 14 MHz, generating a two-week oscillation, generally insufficient for obtaining a reception. Here is the Halocrafter's SkyBuddy S19 first run 1938. The test is performed in the middle of the night. It begins with the medium wave band, using an indoor loop antenna for filtering out the local electrical noise. Miles de personas se han manifestado en las principales capitales y ciudades del mundo contra el... Sensația que se moró este día, afectada de efectiva prelungida de la chapa. Ukrainsko. 
Band 2, or tropical band. The antenna used is now an indoor single wire.
a number station. Shortwave band. Same indoor wire antenna. You, that the Japanese were about to launch a general war against China, and we must get ready to defend the country at any cost.
Ee, baklayı ağzından çıkardın sonunda. Mutsuz olun nedenini bu sözlerinde ara ver. Vous êtes historien, professeur à Sorbonne Université, spécialiste de l'Allemagne et du nazisme à l'occasion de cette journée de commémoration. Gönülden notaya başlıyor. responsable au niveau responsable puisque on changer le modèle des BTC classiques puisqu'on commence à recruter des chauffeurs en CDI. Alors les, les entreprises de la Green Tech Here everything seems to work reasonably well, but this radio is full of surprises, and a few days later, it had to return to the workbench again. After a few days, there was a loud hum again, audible when the volume control was kept relatively high. Using the oscilloscope, it was possible to see that the hum was more pronounced at position C, then less and less visible at B and A. 
also disconnecting the capacitor C15 from the point A and connecting it to ground instead. The audible hum remained loud. Also removing the final amplifier tube, the hum at position C remained visible with the oscilloscope. After more unsuccessful investigation, including the replacement of the shielded connection from C15 to the grid of the preamplifier tube, it was guessed that the culprit could have been the preamplifier tube itself. And yes, it was because replacing the tube, the hum disappeared. Unfortunately, the original tube type 6Q7 that appeared like new and tested like a new tube has a leakage between the filament and the cathode. Here, the leakage neon indicator on the right becomes orange when the cathode has an elevated voltage compared to the filament. When a tube has a Bakelite base, like in this case, there is the possibility that a leakage issue could be caused by dirt accumulated inside. The original tube type 6Q7 of this radio was like new, and such possibility is very unlikely, but it is still worth trying to remove the base, clean the area, and install a new one. First, the base terminals are disoldered. Then, the base is carefully cut below the level of the glass envelope. Before touching the copper wires sticking out of the glass envelope, it is necessary to take a note of their sequence before and after the evacuation pipe. To remove the remaining base ring, a small triangular file is used, paying very much attention to avoid touching the glass envelope. The space between the terminal copper wires is carefully cleaned with a solvent. Some thin copper wires that will be used as extensions are prepared wrapping one end to get a spiral connection. The extensions are connected and soldered to the original terminal copper wires. The wires are insulated using heat shrink pipe.
The wires are inserted in their pins inside the new base, pulling gently out the extensions. The extensions are soldered to their pins and the excesses are cut. Before gluing the base to the glass envelope, the tube is tested again. As already predicted, the cathode is still leaky, but it was worth trying the base cleaning procedure anyway. Otherwise, the tube would work very well. What a pity.